Hi everyone. As you can see from the title of my presentation, I'm going to touch on some rather diverse subjects today, ranging from acoustic properties of the earth to Georgian singing. But I hope to convince you that these topics have more in common than one might think. All of this is related to the research project Computational Ethnomusicology of Traditional Georgian Vocal Music, which is funded by the German Research Council and hosted jointly at the University of Erlangen in Potsdam. The collaborators in this endeavor are Meinhard Müller and Sebastian Rosenzweig in Erlangen, who don't need an introduction in this group. Then Nanam Javanadze, Daniel Vollmer and myself in Potsdam. Nana is an ethnomusicology postdoc and professional singer from Tbilisi. She has been working with me in Potsdam during the last two years and is now back in Georgia. Daniel is our electronic engineer. He has been instrumental in all sensor developments, which I will be talking about. In addition, there have been other collaborators from within both our universities, but also from outside, like Simcha Arom from Paris and David Shugliashvili from Tbilisi, with whom we joined forces on certain topics. The Potsdam part of the project, which I will focus on today, is probably the only ethnomusicological research project in the world which is hosted at an institute of geosciences. The Georgia, which we will be on our mind today, is not the Georgia praised in the popular jazz standard, but the country in the Caucasus region of Eurasia, which is located to the east of the Black Sea. With less than 4 million inhabitants and a size roughly as large as Bavaria, Georgia is a rather small country. However, its traditional polyphonic vocal music is incredibly diverse. It has fascinated musicians and music lovers from all around the world. The most fitting verbal description which I know of is by Mrs. Lars Rostropovich. I let you read the text for yourself. One of the most beautiful ways to experience Georgian singing is at a traditional festive meal, a so-called supra. Supras can last for many hours and involve lots of eating, drinking, ritualized toasting and naturally also singing. As an introduction, I'll let you briefly witness the beginning of a supra during a singing workshop in Western Georgia in 2015, which I participated in. You will hear a song about the beauty of the country. By the way, the woman singing the top voice is Nana. <laughs> Before we get too carried away by the music, I'd like to explain how an ethnomusicology project ended up at a geoscience institute. The main reason is that my main academic background is in physics and geology, but on the side I also took courses in musicology for two years. Until 2016 I have been working as a professor of geophysics at the University of Potsdam. In addition to my more conventional research activities, I've always been interested in sound. I've been fascinated, for example, by the fact that the earth can also be analyzed and understood from the perspective of musical acoustics. In other words, that the earth is also a musical instrument. Over the years, my interest in sound, musicology and musical acoustics has led to a number of interesting projects, sometimes in between art and science. For example, roughly 20 years ago, the composer Wolfgang Loos and myself produced the CD called Inner Earth, which draws its sound exclusively from seismic signals, which have been transformed and ma manipulated in the audible frequency range. 
This is possible because the earth and musical instruments produce signals which have many properties in common. Here you see a mixture of seismic waveforms from volcanoes. One track, however, shows something different. Mary had a little lamb, its feet were quite as slow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb would shoot it all. What you've just heard is probably the first sound recording of a human voice, namely that of Thomas Alva Edison from 1877. The point I want to make with this example is that seismic waveforms from volcanoes and acoustic waveforms of the human voice can look very similar if you compress or stretch the time axis accordingly. However, the relationship between volcanic and vocal signals goes far beyond the similarity of images. This is true in particular for a signal which is called volcanic tremor. Here you see the waveform of such a volcanic tremor from Mount Semeru in Indonesia. The total length of the signal is roughly six minutes. Below you see the spectrum corresponding to the seismogram above. You can see that these signals, by the way, in contrast to earthquake signals, show a very pronounced spectral structure, similar to that of a flute, with overtones at integer multiples of a fundamental frequency. This observation was made in the framework of the master thesis of Vera Schlindwein, one of my first geophysics students about 25 years ago. Here you see a time frequency plot for the same signal, which shows very nicely how the overtones develop as a function of time. If we transpose the signal into the audible range by using the principle of accelerated playback, we can clearly hear when the overtone rich part of the signal starts. I will play this now. A similar example comes from Costa Rica, from Mount Arenal. The color code is the same as in the last figure. Here we can identify roughly three to four partials. Most interesting with respect to this signal, however, is the fact that the fundamental frequency, as well as the overtones, change their frequencies as a function of time. In other words, here we have a developing melody. <laughs> In a flute, this would correspond to a change in the length of the air column. As one of the results of Vera's analysis 25 years ago, it turned out that the flute model, in which the overtones would be generated as different oscillation modes of a resonating gas volume within the volcanic body, was incapable to explain the observed frequencies, since the necessary volumes would be way too big. What is probably going on is a different mechanism, which I'll demonstrate with recordings from yet another volcano, Mount Merapi in central Java. In the top panel, you see the vertical ground motion at one of the seismic stations on the volcano. The total length is now 4.5 days. Based on the amplitudes, we can roughly identify three different sections, a first one, a middle one, and a third one. For each of these three sections, I have selected time windows of two hours duration, which are further enlarged in the lowermost panels. At the beginning of the observations, we can see that the signal consists of rapidly repeating pulses, which subsequently accelerate and finally end in a seemingly random pattern. Let's listen to their sound structure. Now the central part. And the third. to illustrate with this example is that rapidly pulsating sources, like the one shown here, are also an efficient way to generate spectra which are rich in overtones. Here we look at the first of the three time windows. One can clearly identify some overtones by the banded structure. The spectra 
shown on the right, are not completely harmonic though. There would be, however, if the time intervals between the individual pulses would be constant. In this case, we would observe a completely harmonic spectrum with an integer ratio sequence of overtones just like a whistle or a flute, but produced by a different mechanism. A musical instrument which uses this mechanism for the generation of sound is the human voice, or better, the vocal falls or chords within the larynx. The subclottal air pressure causes a rhythmically opening of the vocal falls, which you will be able to see pretty soon, so that pressure pulses can escape and the air pressure in the vocal tract is changing rhythmically. This then generates the sound waves, which we can hear. We will hear a concert pitch A if there are 440 pressure pulses per second. In other words, volcanic tremor signals and the human voice are generated by a rather similar physical mechanism. Instead of the fissures in the rock, which are rhythmically opened by the gas pressure within the volcanic body, which works against the elastic forces of the surrounding rock, for the human voice we have the subclotal air pressure working against the elastic forces of the vocal folds. In both cases the result is a rapidly changing air pressure signal, although at different frequencies. There are many more examples to demonstrate that seismology and musical acoustics have a lot in common. Over the years I have actually given many talks on this fascinating topic at schools and museums as part of the outreach program of our university. For now, however, the given example has to suffice to explain that it did not take too much efforts to get me interested in computational analysis of singing. For me, the triggering event to make this happen occurred about 10 years ago in this castle, which is located in the small town of Belzig, south of Berlin. It was during a singing workshop of an American voice teacher named Frank Kane, who lives in Paris and teaches traditional Georgian singing. Until then, my musical activities had been primarily instrumental, mostly related to classical music. It was through the initial workshops by Frank that I changed my mind and became fascinated by traditional Georgian vocal music, both as an amateur singer and a researcher. The way Frank Kane teaches Georgian singing is special, because for him a key element of traditional Georgian singing is, as he describes it, sharing of vibrations. As a consequence, he uses singing generated body vibrations in a lot of his exercises. In one of his first workshops which I attended, he asked the participant to try to sing into their bones and try to feel the vibrations in their knee. I didn't know at first if I should see this as one of those educational images which singing teachers can be very, very creative about or as something which really has a physical basis. Being a curious person who had worked with waves and vibrations for most of my professional life, I wanted to find out. So after one of his workshops, I asked him if, we, if he could uh, let me try to measure these obscure body vibrations. He agreed and we jointly started some seismologically inspired experiments. Here you see us in a sound studio in Berlin which we did together with Wolfgang Loos from the University of the Arts in Berlin and some of his sound engineering students. What we wanted to try to find out is if this phenomenon of body vibrations is real, measurable and reproducible. We wanted to understand how these vibrations move through the body if we could measure them. And we also wanted to test if people who are singing together would react to the physical vibration of the singers around them or simply to the sound or the visual impression. And we wanted to know how body vibrations relate, are related to audible sound. During my initial literature search on this topic, I realized that in the 60s to the 80s of the last century, body vibrations had been a topic of quite some interest for voice physiologists and vocal scientists. But then, maybe with the exception of the work of Ori Takada in Hamburg, it had practically fallen into oblivion. Since then, however, this area has been researched quite intensively in other contexts, for example, in the context of communication technologies, 
and or in a medical context. One of the first technical challenges was to find out what kind of instruments to use. Since my prior experience as seismologist was with big sensors, Daniel Vollmer and myself experimented quite a bit with different uh, sensors and we finally settled on what is called a larynx microphone, which you can see here. We soon realized that body vibrations during singing can be detected all over the body. What was surprising to us in this context, however, was the high fidelity uh, with which these body vibrations could be recorded. For example, in the spectrograms on the right, one can clearly identify not only the melody, but also the singer's voice quality, even in the lowermost uh, recording taken from the toe. We also analyzed how body vibrations propagate within the body by measuring the time delay which the signal took from the larynx down to the toe. And an effective way is by bone conduction. Let's listen to an example of a recording from the toe. It sounds very noisy, but one can clearly recognize the melody quite well. With my growing interest in Georgian vocal music, my dormant interest in musicology got new fuel and I started to read whatever I could get my eyes on regarding Georgian vocal music. In addition, I made contact with the ethnomusicologist Susanne Ziegler in Berlin, who had worked for many years on traditional Georgian music and who generously allowed me to bombard her with all kinds of questions which for her most have sounded incredibly naive, I believe. Through her and through the ethnomusicologist Simcha Arom, which you see here, whom I met for the first time during an international symposium on traditional polyphony in Tbilisi in 2014, I learned more about how ethnomusicologists perform fieldwork. With this slide, which depicts a number of famous ethnomusicologists at work, I simply want to remind you of the kind of recording setups which are traditionally used. What is usually recorded is acoustical sound and more recently maybe video. Subsequently, ethnomusicologists usually transcribe what they hear into a Western notation system. Here you see an example for such a transcription taken from a paper by Susanne Ziegler. In order to capture the actual pitches, which might considerably deviate from an equal tempered scale, special signs like little arrows up or little arrows down are used to quantify the microtonal structure of the song. As far as I know, the same principle is more or less used today. It does not take much fantasy to realize that this can become rather challenging. For example, with respect to recognizing individual pitches of individual voices. Even if this would be solved, the process remains very subjective. It is always an interpretation. And of course, the whole transcription process might be problematic simply because the notation system might be inadequate. Being a naive seismologist, I thought it might be interesting to reframe the voice separation problem simply as a seismological observation task. This used to be my professional bread and butter for many years. Vibrational sensors are designed to record primarily the elastic vibrations of the muscle close to the larynx, so they should be insensitive to acoustic waves from neighboring singers propagating through the air. In other words, they should solve the voice separation problem already during recording. This voice separation problem is a very well-known problem in ethnomusicology which has troubled people for a long time. Just two examples of how people have tried to deal with this. One of the first recordings for the Berlin Phonogram Archive was a Thai theater ensemble in 1900. In order to obtain separate recordings for each musician, Karl Stumpf had the musicians play together and individually, which of course yielded quite different results. 
Simcha Arum, for his work on African polyphony and polyrhythm, developed a sophisticated re-recording technique to understand the contributions of the individual musicians. The drawback of all re-recording technique, however, is that it's impossible to record mutual interactions, since part of the music is already fixed. Of course, for historical records one has to use what's available, but for new recordings one could think about different options. I also thought that recording of body vibration would be very well suited for automatic processing and might allow to experiment with new ways of documenting and analyzing this music. At first, these were only hypotheses which needed to be tested. This we did together again with Wolfgang Loos from the University of Arts in Berlin and some of his sound engineering students in a studio. We compared larynx microphone recordings with conventional and directional audio recordings. The yodeling group Lavashki Kree volunteered as our guinea pigs. The reason for choosing yodeling as a test case was that regarding voice separation, this is a rather challenging scenario because the dynamics of the individual singers rapidly change. I will now let you listen to the beginning of one song and then I will show you the results. Here you now see the larynx microphone recording output uh, which was being put through Tony and you see here the pitch tracks and the note tracks and you will I will let you listen now to the synthetic sound which is produced by the Tony software. And now for the second singer. achieved with directional microphone as you see here. So the lesson learned from this experiment led us to the conclusion that body vibration recordings contain the essential information of a singer's voice regarding pitch, intonation and voice intensity needed for computational analysis, but offer the additional advantage that they are practically unaffected by the voices of other singers. The consequences of this property are rather far-reaching because they allow for the quantitative and reproducible analysis of the contribution of each singer while they are singing together. I would like to mention that the use of body vibration sensors for pitch analysis was not invented by us, but was pioneered roughly 40 years ago on the technical level available at that time in a laboratory study of barbershop singing by, I think you can guess whom, Hagemann and Johann Sundberg. To the best of my knowledge, however, it had never before been systematically applied in ethnomusicological fieldwork. And this is what I was hoping to be able to do. So the big question was, would it also work outside a studio? As the Japanese poet Basho has suggested more than 300 years ago, that if you want to know something about pine trees, you have to go where they are. So in 2015, the time seemed ripe for a small-scale field experiment, a pilot study. The year before, I had met Nanam Javanadze, who at that time was working on her PhD on Swan music, music from Swanetti, you see here. She knew the music, the area and the people very well and was able to set up all the contacts to local village singers. I took a multi-channel audio interface along which I had to carry on my lap for the whole time during the trips on those really really bumpy roads to protect it from the most extreme shocks, a couple of larynx microphones and a very basic video recorder. Svaneti is a very fascinating place because it's one of the rare regions where very old and presumably pre-Christian traditions are still cultivated as part of daily life. 
and it's also a beautiful landscape which you can experience there. Swan songs, as part of the Swan rituals, occupy a very special place within the Georgian music, since presumably the first stages of its development have been preserved in them. Here are some of the people which we were able to record during that experiment. The singers are from left to right Islam Pilvani, Gigo Chamgeliani and Murad Piskelani from Lengeri and Lachushti. Islam Pilpani, who unfortunately passed away in 2018, was a very well-known singer and a long-time leader of the ensemble Riho. Sadly, Gigo Chamgeliani, the top voice singer, also has passed away since then. You can see the praise of the larynx microphone around their necks here. First, let's watch and listen to one of the first recordings during that trip. In preparation for this trip, I had concentrated primarily on the acoustical and the larynx microphone recordings. Only right before we left, I thought that taking along a video camera might be not a bad idea. So I took a small, low-quality camera along, which performed quite well under good light conditions, but rapidly got to its limits under poor lighting. Nevertheless, the recording turned out to be still informative regarding the communication between the singers. Here you see the result of the analysis of the larynx microphone recording of Islam Pilpani's voice when seeing the monophonic introduction followed by the beginning of the polyphonic part. The black lines are the trajectories of the individual partials, the lowest one indicating the fundamental frequency. The blue rectangular box show note objects as they are determined by the hidden Markov model using the pitch tracks of Bertoni again. The key aspect of what I want to demonstrate with this slide is that when I play this recording back to you is that in the polyphonic part we will only hear the larynx microphone recording of Islam Pilpani's voice and none of the other singers. This demonstrates how well the voice separation using larynx microphones actually works. <laughs> The results of the pilot study were very encouraging. The two most important aspects were that the singers accepted to be recorded with these strange devices, and furthermore that even for strong male singers, larynx microphone recordings were able to capture the contributions of the individual singers undisturbed by the other singers. We concluded that the field recordings of body vibrations could provide new and very valuable information which could be used for ethnomusicological research. So in 2016, Nana and myself went back into the field for three months for a systematic field acquisition, covering a total of roughly 250 sets of different recordings of folk songs, religious hymns, funeral songs, prayers and lamenting. Our overall main goal was to document the current state of traditional multi-voice singing in Upper Svaneti, this is this region here, a very mountainous region in the northwest of the country. The red dots in the, show the recording locations, which were located mostly in Upper Svaneti, but also in some of the outside villages, which are called Swan Echo Villages, where people had been relocated uh, to in the 90s of the last century, which are distributed all over the country. The standard recording setup consisted of one DPA-466F headset microphone for each of the singer, larynx microphones, a stereo recorder for the room recording, and a directional microphone on top of the video camera which we also used for interviews. 
In addition to each recording session, Nana performed extensive interviews with all the singers and local informants which she could find. Sometimes with local assistance as here in the case of this little girl from Ditgori. Now I have to open a second thread of my story. In 2015, after I had returned from the pilot study in Svaneti, I participated in my first Izmir meeting in Malaga, simply to learn more about this rapidly evolving field of research. In particular, I was very interested for, uh, to explore similarities but also differences between seismological signal processing and processing of audio signals. During one of the evening concerts, I happened to sit right next to this man who turned out to be my not. And this meeting turned out to have a lot of consequences for both of us. The trigger for these consequences was this man, Artem Erkomai Shvili, one of the last master chanters of Georgian liturgical chant, who passed away in 1967 at the age of 81 years. In 1966, one year before his death, at the age of 80, Artem Erkomaishvili was asked to perform a series of chants to save them for posteriority. Since chanting was prohibited during the Soviet period, he had no fellow singers to sing with him. Therefore, he had to sing all three voices by himself. This performance was recorded at the Tbilisi State Conservatory using two tape recorders, which were subsequently operated in what is now called overdubbing. A polished version of some of these recordings has been remastered a few years ago and released as a CD with the name Pearls of George and Sands. Here you see the cover. When I had come across Artem Erkomaishvili's recordings, I thought that because of the special recording setup, it might be possible to separate the individual voices with techniques which we are also using in seismology. The results of my attempt seemed okay, promising, but were not really impressive. This was the time when I remembered my conversation with Meinert in Malaga. I sent him a long email, explained the problem and asked him if he had an idea how to solve it. Not only did he have an idea how to attack the problem, he also had a brilliant student, Sebastian, who then solved the problem very nicely in his master thesis. This led to our still ongoing collaboration and finally to the proposal of the project which we are currently working on. So this is essentially how I ended up working in computational ethnomusicology of traditional Georgian vocal music, where we want to combine classical ethnomusicological approaches with computational methods. What now helps us enormously in our analysis is that the voice separation problem is already solved for our two main datasets. In other words, we have separate recordings for each of the individual singers' voices. For the Erkomai Shvili dataset, this was achieved by, sloppily speaking, reversing the overdubbing, and for our fieldwork corpus, by adding larynx microphones to the recording set. In this context, I also want to mention that thanks to Sebastian, Meinert and their co-workers in Erlangen, both datasets are accessible through a really nice web-based audio-video interface through which each of the recorded synchronized tracks can be very conveniently accessed individually or jointly. The video tracks are also quite important to analyze nonverbal communication between the singers. We are now starting the third year of our project with at least one more year to go. As far as the musicological perspective is concerned, that's what Nana and myself have been focusing on in Potsdam, we were able to touch upon a whole range of very diverse research topics. Tonal organization, analysis of chord progressions, funeral dirges, new ways of representation and also interaction and synchronization phenomena. For the remaining time of my presentation, I obviously had to make a choice of what to discuss. I will first mention what I'm not discussing today. I will not discuss our work on Artem Erkomaishvili and the Erkomaishvili dataset today. During the last three years, this has resulted in a whole sequence of papers, the last one being a 64-page monograph, 
which sort of wraps up what this data set reveals regarding the Georgian tuning and scale systems. All of these papers are available on our website for anyone wanting to dive into this material more deeply. What I want to briefly discuss are some of our experiments regarding the visual representation of traditional Georgian vocal music. What used to be done, and still is quite common among ethnomusic colleges, is that the music is transcribed into a five-line staff notation. However, five-line staff notation ignores tuning and microtonality and forces the music into a Western system. On the other hand, it's extremely well established among musicians, compresses the information very effectively and can capture a lot of aspects of the music, such as dynamic and temporal structures. Since we have the individual audio tracks for each of the singer, it's now fairly easy to generate joint pitch and note tracks, as in the upper left panel. This represents a particular performance of a song in a fairly unbiased way and includes all the microtonal details. However, it is overly complex and one could say it contains too much of unwanted information for a musician. The situation becomes better if we only use just the note tracks, which still capture the microtonality of the song and reduce the information to a manageable amount. However, it will still be difficult, if not impossible, to sing from such a score, because it does not become clear what features are actually ornamental and or caused by pitch instabilities of the singer. We can see that the pitches of the individual voices fluctuate a little bit, but we can also visually identify the average pitches for each scale degree. If we now map the fluctuating note pitches for each scale degree to their center values, we can obtain something which could be used as a well, more normative representation of the song in the sense that it could be interpreted as what the singers intended to sing. It still captures the tuning system but not the microtonal fluctuations. Finally, if you want to acknowledge that this is a modal music, we could add some additional musicological interpretation and change the vertical axis into a simple mode degrees, similar to how some singing teachers use their fingers to indicate a particular mode degree. As a completely different approach, we have also experimented with video representations of songs in which a cursor follows the pitch and note trajectories while you can listen to the music. Uh, Reza Dokt Dolatabadi, one of my geophysics PhD students, has combined this with a PiWeb audio player by Powells and Sanders, so that the volumes of the individual voices can be individually controlled. There's a lot of information on this screen. On the left, you see the videos of the individual singers' faces. Below them, you will be able to see the lyrics of the individual voices. Sometimes they sing different words. Below here is the PiWeb audio player interface. Here you can control the individual volumes of the individual voices. To the right of the pitch and note trajectories, you see the pitch distribution, which indicates the frequency of occurrence of the individual pitches. The horizontal lines uh, denote the actually voice pitches, which is sung, the, where the cursor position is. The black horizontal numbers indicate the center pitches of the individual pitch groups. We've represented this as a Gaussian mixture model, so to make it easier. And the horizontal, the, the tilted uh, numbers uh, give the intervals between two neighboring pitch degrees. And here in the upper right, you can also see a description of the actual chord which is played. So the center number in this uh, ellipse gives the bass voice pitch in sense, and the subscript and superscript give the harmonic interval from the middle to the bass or from the top to the bass. I will play you an example here. <laughs> Well, 
We are still facing some technical problems with the synchronization of multi-track audio and video, but you can already see how we try to visually represent the music in this experiment. For those of you who saw Matan Gover's fantastic talk at the end of last year, you may realize that what I'm showing here is like a poor man's version of the rehearsal tools which have been developed within the Voctra Lab Strompa project. It needs to be emphasized that all of this is still very experimental. I also want to say that we should not forget that all visual representations of music are reductionist models of the actual music. And as the statistician Box has once said, all models, and this is true also for visual representations of music, are wrong. But some of them are useful. So it's now our job to find out which of them are useful. Let me now switch to a very special music scenario, namely a special type of funeral dirges, which is called Zer in the Swan language or Zari in Georgian. For me, this has been the most archaic and most intense sound experience of my whole life. Zer is a three-voiced male chant, which is sung on the day of a funeral before the corpse of the deceased is put into the grave. The singers, usually stand outside of the house of the deceased, behind a table with food and drinks. Different villages used to have different variants of there, although now only 11 different variants are said to be actively maintained. Since Swan funeral rituals are believed to be very old, our collection of their recordings is a particular gem in our dataset, for research as well as culturally. Here you see again all the ensembles and the spatial distribution of the recording locations from our 2016 field expedition. Out of all the 250 recordings, a total of 12 performances were related to ritual funeral laments. One, this one here, is related to a solo wailing of a woman. The other 11 are representing Zer, a total of five different variants. To give you a more concrete impression of what I'm talking about, we will now listen to the beginning of the Latli variant. Latli or Latali in Georgian is a village about nine kilometers away from Mestia, the regional center of Upper Svaneti. <laughs> benefits of larynx microphone recordings for musicological analysis of polyphonic music is that a number of visual representations and diagnostic tools can easily be derived directly from the raw recordings using well-tested algorithms for monophonic analysis. As already briefly mentioned before, these are for example the fundamental frequency trajectories which show the sung melodies, the note trajectories, in which some of the intonation artifacts are already removed. The representation which we find the most convenient tool in the present context is what we have called harmonic mellograph plot, which combines a melodic and a harmonic perspective. The principle behind the generation of a harmonic mellograph is quite simple. Here it's illustrated for the middle and the top voice. First, we select a matching note pair in the top and the middle voice. Here we take the first one in the polyphonic part. Subsequently, we measure the harmonic interval size, which in this case is 700 cents. Next, we look for the corresponding color code for this interval size and paint the distance, the space between the two notes accordingly. This procedure is then repeated for the next intervals until the whole song has been processed. The procedure for the middle and the bass voice is the same. 
For the interval between the bass voice and the top voice, however, there's a small problem because the space between these voices is already used up to color code the middle to top voice intervals and the bass to middle voice intervals. A simple solution in this case is to paint the interval below the bass voice as vertical mirror image, like it's done here. So we're painting the interval between the bass and the top voice by just this mirror image. So here you can see that the harmonic mellograph now shows the melodic by the shape of the uh, individual voice trajectories and the harmonic information by the color coding of a three voice song in a single plot. And here you see now the harmonic mellograph plots for all the 11 Zaire recordings from our mini corpus. One important aspect which can immediately be seen from this figure is that the intervals between the bass and the top voice integrated by the vertical bars hanging below the bass voice melody are dominated all by the bluish color representing 700 cents corresponding to a fifth. In other words, most of the times bass and top voice move in parallel fifth. All 11 recordings belong to five different variants. These are shown here in such a way that at the top we have a short duration, a simple structure, small ambitus and a simple harmonic structure. Primarily this, the very famous 1-4-5 accord and a few thirds. In the bottom we see longer duration, so here we see like five minutes, while here we see like two and a half minutes. A more complex structure simply by many more colors, a larger ambitus, so the range between the lowest and the highest note is larger, and a complex harmonic structure, so according to increasing elaboration. This of course immediately triggers the question, at least for a geoscientist, if the acoustic character of a Zer is related in a systematic way to any contextual aspect of the funeral ritual, for example, to the geographical location. Here in the upper right panel, you see the recording locations in red circles and the locations of origin of the individual Zer variants in black stars plotted on a geographical map. This region is extremely mountainous, as you can see here in the overview in the upper left panel. Mount Elbrus with 5,600 and something meters, which you can see here, is the highest mountain in the whole Caucasus mountain range. As you can see here, the origins of the different Zaire variants shown by the red circles are all on or very close to the Anguri River Valley, which is shown here by the blue line. If we line them up according to the course of the river, we can see that the musical acoustical structure of this air systematically changes along the course of the river. And this strongly correlates with the exposure of the settlements to non-Swan influences. Samikrello is below here. This underlines very nicely the importance of contextual information, sometimes just geographic information, for the analysis of this kind of music. The phenomenon of funeral dirges has many more additional fascinating facets, which require different approaches for their analysis. What I've just touched upon is only one part of a study which appeared in Musicologists most recently. Closely related is a study led by Nana, in which we undertook a classical musicological structure analysis and a comparison of Zair with the different generative models which have been proposed for polyphonic music. An interesting outcome of this comparison was that none of the popular models which try to explain polyphony as a result of an evolutionary process which starts from monodic melodies can explain the emergence of the musical structure in Zair. What remains more likely as an explanation for us is that Zaire has emerged as an original sound form. Another interesting finding which we stumbled upon is related to the phonetic properties of Zaire. We realized that some swan singers employ a vocal technique known as formant tuning. 
There's a rather long story behind this, which we discuss in another paper, which is not yet published, but which you can find on our website. Just to illustrate this briefly, in the bottom panel I'm showing the evidence for form and tuning in the top voice and the middle voice recording of the Latli Sayer sung by the Udapna singers. Men are known in particular to tune their second formant to higher harmonics if they want to have a real powerful note or when their voice turns over. I found this in a book by Bozeman and uh, O'Connor on vocal acoustics. And finally, during our field expedition in 2016, but in particular Nana during her PhD work, we have collected a lot of material on the cultural context of there, which up to now is available only as an unpublished manuscript from our website, as well as from the Lazar database at the University of Jena. There are two points which I want to make here. First, I believe that there's a lot to learn from a quantitative analysis of our new collection of field recordings of Sayer about the general aspects of traditional Georgian vocal music. However, I don't want to create the impression that I feel that any isolated analysis would be sufficient to understand the music. I look at ethnomusicology as an extremely interdisciplinary research field in which different perspectives should not compete, but should complement each other. I'm coming to the end of my presentation in which I've tried to provide a glimpse on some aspects of our research project. What I've tried to show is that by reframing the recording of the singing voice as a seismological observation task, the source separation problem can easily be solved during the recording. The recordings of muscle vibrations are perfectly suited for computational analysis of singing voices while the singers sing in their natural environment, which then opens the door for new analysis and representation methods. After two years into our project, we have come to believe that combining classical ethnomusicological analysis with computational tools can provide new insights regarding a number of long-standing research questions on traditional Georgian vocal music. In addition, it's a fascinating research field where one can combine the passion for music with fascination for science. This concludes my main presentation. I suggest to stop here. One question which we have become particularly interested in in Potsdam is how we could possibly improve the recording of body vibrations related to singing. I shall now share with you what we are currently working on in that respect. Around the turn of this century, there have been many attempts centered in Japan to develop more private mobile phone communication by trying to pick up the body vibration signals from people speaking more or less silently. This kind of very soft phonation is called non-audible murmur or simply NAM. This slide from a paper by Hirahara et al. shows the location of different types of vocal sounds according to the phonation type and phonation energy on the horizontal axis and propagation type on the vertical axis. With larynx microphones, we are picking up signals of intermediate phonation energy which propagate through the body tissue and through the bones. Non-audible murmur has even less phonation energy than whispering and is a signal propagating mostly through soft tissues. In order to achieve the sensitivity needed to pick up the extremely soft muscle vibrations generated by the non-audible murmur, several groups in Japan have developed so-called special NAM sensors or NAM microphones. The technical trick to achieve this was to reduce the impedance contrast between the soft tissue or the muscle through which the signal propagates and the usually hard metallic sensor surface. As sketched here, this can be done by removing the metal housing of the condenser microphone capsule and embedding the open sensor within a soft silicon which has a similar shore hardness as muscle tissue. Naturally, this type of sensor could be very interesting for our purposes. After many attempts to contact any of the developers 
or to buy such a um, microphone, I finally was able to make contact to Tatsuya Hirahara, the first author of one of the large Japanese papers on non-microphones. He wrote me that industry had lost interest in this technique, actually, and that he personally had also given up on this kind of research. However, he was so kind to send us two of his sensors, which he was no longer using. This enabled us to build our own NAM sensor, simply copying his design. The person who actually did this is Daniel Vollmer, our electronic engineer. And here you can see Daniel with our NAM microphone prototype. One of the big challenges was and still is to find the optimum way to attach the NAM microphone to the body. For mobile phone communication, the sensor would usually be put at a position slightly behind and below the ear, roughly like it's shown here. It turned out, however, that the signal to noise ratio which we could achieve so far with our uh, attachment device was not really better than what we can achieve with larynx microphones. The problem is that we still have to tightly connect the sensor to the skin. If it's just loosely connected, the coupling is not good enough. The advantage, however, is that singers feel less disturbed by the presence of the sensor. So with such a device, the singers will not feel like someone is strangling in comparison to if you have a larynx microphone put here. During our field work, we rarely encounter this problem with men, but sometimes with women. But for classical singers, but also for yodelers, this turned out to be a really serious problem. Before the corona restrictions went into effect, we had started to experiment with different sensor locations on the neck in the hope of finding a position where we can apply enough pressure to the sensor and really see an improvement of the signal to noise ratio in comparison to larynx microphones. For this purpose, we built a flexible attachment device with which we can stably attach the sensor in different positions and at different neck locations by shifting the sensor here and by opening the attachment device as at different angles. This device still waits to be applied systematically once our lab opens again for new experiments. Another sensor which we have started to experiment with is this one. This is normally used in electronic stethoscopes. It has a very high sensitivity and an extremely wide bandwidth, going from a few hertz to a few kilohertz. This sensor could possibly replace larynx microphone sensors and in addition capture the singer's heartbeat. One drawback is that it's extremely expensive in comparison to NAM sensors or sensors used in larynx microphones. Like for the NAM sensor, we wait for the end of the corona restrictions to move on with our experiments. The reason why I've become interested in heartbeat recordings is that through heartbeat recordings, one can observe some aspects of nonverbal interaction of singers, for example, entrainment. In 2019, during another field expedition to Western Georgia, Nana and myself, together with the example Ensemble Khelkhwavi from Osogeti, conducted an experiment to monitor the possible synchronization of the singer's heartbeat rates during a recording session. By now there are a few studies where this phenomenon has been observed for choir singers, when they are singing very simple songs together. And I wanted to see what happens with a small ensemble and rather complex music. So in addition to our usual headset and larynx microphone setup, each singer got equipped with a pulse sensor taped to his index finger. We will now watch and listen to this recording session. I will skip forward once in a while, but I want to give you an impression of how the dynamics of the song also develops. You can also witness that the quality of our video footage has improved considerably between 2015 and 2019. In 2019 we were accompanied by a professional cinematographer. Rotsat <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so Nana explained the singers what is going to happen. you can watch the complete video on our website. The individual pulse sensor recordings are subject to quite different amounts of high frequency noise. Here you see the raw pulse sensor recordings for the three singers. After low pass filtering the signal to noise ratio visibly increases, in particular for the recording of the top voice singer. Nevertheless the heartbeat recording quality still differs strongly for the individual singers possibly due to differences in the individual coupling. However, for all the singers, one can clearly recognize all the typical deflections seen on an electrocardiogram. The so-called QRS complex, amplified here for the middle voice singer, is most visibly obvious as in each of the recordings. It corresponds to the contraction of the large ventricular muscles, the systole being the tightening and the diastole being the relaxing part of the cardiac cycle. Since the quality of individual pulse sensor recording stiffers as a function of time, but also depending on the achieved sensor coupling, the extraction of a continuous sequence of heartbeats constitutes a challenging signal processing task. This was done by Meinhardt using the concept of predominant local pulse functions as proposed by Crosher and Müller in a paper 2011 and also described in Meinhardt's textbook. The PLP function shown in red, here superimposed on the low pass filtered heartbeat recordings, can be regarded as a pulse tracker that can adjust to continuous and sudden changes in tempo as long as the underlying novelty function possesses locally periodic patterns. The differences of the peaks of the PLP function, which is plotted here, is a measure of the heartbeat variability of a person. And it can be seen here to correlate quite well for the singers of the middle and the top voice recording for most of the song's duration. This means that the hearts of Guram and Mamuka accelerate and decelerate more or less simultaneously on the time scale given by the average distance of 10 seconds here. This may be caused by a synchronization of their respiration and a coupling between respiration and heartbeat via a phenomenon called respiratory sinus arrhythmia, RSA, but then there are possibly also other factors which I'm not aware of. In contrast, the heart rate variability of the bass voice singer Lasha shows less amplitude variation and no 
clear correlation to either the middle or the top voice. I don't want to interpret these uh, results further now, but I think they are quite encouraging and suggest that there is still a lot to learn from these kind of experiments. This brings me now to the final slide, which I want to leave you with. It's another haiku poem by the Japanese poet Matsuo Basho, which I find is a beautiful reminder that the questions are much more important than the ways we try to answer them. And I believe this is true for any type of research. For more information, I also refer you to our website where you can find the complete video of the experiment we did and some other material. Thank you very much.